When thunder roars, go indoors. Wow, we got a good one for you tonight, and I think and I can actually back that up finally, right? Okay, you saw who's coming up. It's Leslie, hello. Uh, hello. Listen, how excited are you to say hello to our first guest? And I haven't been on a program with him in many years, and we did radio together for a number of years, and it was the highlight of my show, I think. Mr. Tom Skilling, the Walt Disney of weather. If you have lived in Chicago, you know this man's work. It's mesmerizing. And he is coming to us from our 50th state. Wait till you see the background. <laughs> For <laughs> those of you. There he is. Hold, oh, that's oh Hawaii. <laughs> Look at that. I remember the first day on the radio I worked with you is after one of those abominable weekends when there were all these shootings. And you said 79 shootings. We can do better than that. And I was horrified at the moment but i came to realize that that's about the only way you can treat anything that horrible you know and that's why gary we we miss you so much in this crazy day and age that we're in now and your honest evaluation of what's going on in the world but what do you think well thank you well what do i think of it it's blue sky probably (laughs) about 80 degrees you're in you're in hawaii I mean, come on. You know what? what can I? I remember you and Steve doing live broadcasts, and little did I, I had never been to Hawaii at that point, but you did live broadcasts from out here. Yeah. You know, I told the folks on this uh, resort, the grounds of the resort, that we were doing a podcast, and they said, Oh, that's exciting. I don't think we've ever done a podcast from here. We're on the big island Crazy. Uh, in the southern end of the uh, Hawaiian chain. And boy, it's been blowing like crazy. We have white caps on there and they're warning people to be careful swimming and all the rest. Well, but, Tom, uh, let me just say, yeah. uh, that, that has to be the only place on earth that nobody's ever done a podcast because it's 8 million podcasts oh. there. My God. Well, if they need somebody to be embedded on that island doing a yeah. podcast, you have them uh, call me and I'll be over. Uh, here's what I want to say. Around yeah. this time when we were working together, we would be doing our Christmas show at the top of the John Hancock building, which is this beautiful building in Chicago, 100 stories. We'd be 94, 95 floors up. And it was a magnificent show. They really treated us so well. You came up there and did the weather and we had such a good time. That was another moment we brought listeners up. And when I get to this point in the year, I think, oh God, boy, I missed that stuff. I, you know, it's true. Wasn't that fun? I, you know, I'd almost forgotten about that. And, uh, it was all for a, a great cause, too, as I remember. You raised money, uh, and uh, the whole crew was there. It was a lot of yeah, fun. Yeah, it was good. It was so much fun. And you would yes. come up, and your colleague, J- Jim Ramsey, Jim, did the yeah. weather from there one day. And it was funny how I thought, okay, I like synergy. I like to cross-promote the different pieces of a company's product. Yeah. And because we were owned by the same people, I thought, well, why not have your weather guy come and do – the weather at the John Hancock building around Christmas. And it was jumping through hoops every time. They just couldn't quite, I mean, it wasn't technically that difficult. And now it's much easier, but we got it done. And I'll remember those days forever. And sadly, Jim passed away a couple of years ago. But what a great guy. Let's talk about him for just a minute because he was such a player. Anything you wanted to do, he was willing to do. You know what? Ramsey and I would talk about crazy goings at the station and we'd start laughing and i mean the laughs would go on for like two hours and all i could think i said to jim you know anybody who walks by this office is going to presume we've been consuming adult beverages or something because nobody laughs like that just as a matter of course but yeah yeah he he was that way on my show when you would go on vacation he'd fill in yeah and we we had as much fun as you and i did now let me just say uh, everybody is really waiting for that moment when Tom leaves the huh. TV station after many decades to think, oh, my God, where's Tom? And that's coming up because you were the and still are for a few more months, the Walt Disney of weather. When I would watch <laughs> your 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 weather forecast, I'd start Pink Floyd album, Dark Side of the Moon. And then about two minutes in, I just I was I was just in a trance. I, it was like an opium den. It's just <laughs> Visually, you really are the Walt Disney of weather. I mean, the you stuff what, starts coming at you. and You coined that phrase. And, you know, I remember when you and Steve used to do Tommy Skillethead. 
when I first heard about that, I thought, oh, brother, there goes the career. Uh, you know, <laughs> I just uh, I figured it was all over. It turned out to be the best thing that ever happened because you guys introduced me to a whole demographic who tuned in to see who this nut Tommy Skillet had really was. And uh, and it, w- it was something else. Do you know, Gary, I don't know what I ever told you. I was downtown on Michigan Avenue in front of the Hancock building and a cop came up to me and he said, hey, do you hear what those two do to you every afternoon on the radio? And he said, you want me to harass, uh, do something about that? I said, officer, please. Um, do something. They keep you want me to it. shoot those guys? You want no. me to take care of them? No, I, I said, please, Steve Sanders, um, one of my co-anchors for many years on the Midday Show, used to say, how do I get somebody to make fun of me on afternoon drive radio every day? It's the best damn advertisement that anybody could come up with. And I Well, here's the analogy, Tom. It's like Taylor Swift dating an NFL player. A whole yeah. demographic that never watched football is watching yeah. football. It's the same thing. It's the it's same thing. thing. It, you know, and I remember um, you and Steve would talk, and you were the first one. You said, you know, we make fun of him every day, but um, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And I remember <laughs> thinking, you know, that was really nice. And then we did that um, show. You called me and said, would you appear? What, what was the theater? It was uh, in Lincoln I think Park. it was the Park West in Chicago. Park West. Right? Yeah. And we, they said, here, you know, I got down there in the green room. I had never met you guys in the flesh before. And, uh, but I, you said, come on down if you would. And I said, I'd, I'd love to do it. I'd love to meet you. And so went down there. And the bit was that I was to walk out on stage after Steve, who had a, a pocket slide rule in there and all, and, and his weather maps doing his Tommy Skillet character. He was going to walk off stage and say, I got to get some maps. And I was to walk on. So I thought, okay. And so I walked on it and it's dead quiet. That theater was, you could have heard, heard a pin drop. And I thought, oh my God, I couldn't see the audience because you were up there on stage and you had floodlights coming down. I thought, my God, this thing is royally bombing. And, uh, oh, no. and then, Are you then kidding the voice me? comes out and says, it's the real Tommy Skillet head. And the place went crazy. And I, oh, uh, yeah, really, Tom, you were such a great addition <laughs> to all of our live shows that you attend. And I really, I, I can't say enough about, I'm so glad we became friends along the way I Isn't mean, the truth? you you are to me one of my my dearest friends and i really enjoyed every moment we spent on the radio now i got to get to some weather because you can tell us more than anybody white christmas matters we're having yeah. a la nina el nino la el nino la, yeah la taco yeah. bell or something <laughs> and outside of mountainous areas is there any snow across the country it's the middle well, of december start getting it but you know, uh, these El Nino, and this is a strong El Nino, too. Do you remember that 65 degree Christmas we had back in 82? Yes. It was people were walking on, uh, you know, uh, down on Oak Street Beach in shorts. That was a strong El Nino winter. And that's what El Nino can do. It bathes the country in Pacific air and cuts down on the stay of Arctic air masses. So you tend to be warm, you tend to get less snow overall. Doesn't mean there won't be snowstorms or Arctic outbreaks, but it means there won't be as many as usual. And when all is said and done at the end of the season, it'll probably have wound up being kind of a warmer than normal, less snowy than warmer, uh, normal winter, which is and bad it's news 10 for days, folks. We're 10, 10 days away from Christmas, Tom. And as you yeah. told me and everybody else, you really can't predict accurately more than seven days out, right? On a day-to-day basis. So yeah. what do you see? And just throw it out there for the next 10 days across well, the country. Anybody could have a white Christmas outside of mountainous areas. In El Nino years, uh, California, the Southwest and the Southern states and up and down the East Coast get in trouble. I I was interested in that uh, video from Orlando that Alan, your producer, put up uh, at the beginning. It's those kinds of storms. Now, that thing will barrel up the East Coast, and that will be not the only one like that that we see this year. So, uh, yeah, look at that. Uh, that's the beginning of a major nor'easter, and that thing's going to bomb out off the East Coast and deepen quickly, and there'll be wind and rain and, and well inland up in the higher elevation snow. That's an El Nino uh, winter trade. On the other hand, we in the Midwest, the Northern Plains, uh, Northern Rockies tend to be shy uh, on snow and, and cold. Not that it doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen as much. So it'll be interesting. They're watching, you know, with the reservoirs full now after that 
wet winter in California last year, uh, they're watching closely to see if they keep the, the moisture coming. They need it desperately out there, uh, although not as much as they did before last winter, which turned stormy. And El Nino winters are normally kind of stormy out there. So what do you say and as far as snow in the next 10 days? What do you see? I, in your you know what? Ball? I haven't looked at the day-to-day charts, Gary. To That's right. You're, you're, you're not working. You shouldn't have know, to look at Okay. It's a, it's let's a talk about let's do, you, so, it's a general proposition. The chances for big snows are lower than they normally are in yeah. the Midwest Chicago. Yeah. All right. Now, you yeah. are retiring February after how many years? 45 years at uh, WGN, over half a century doing this, Gary. I, you know, I tell all the young people that go through our office or have over the years as interns, uh, they are probably witnessing the most interesting uh, era in meteorology because what's happened in the last 50 years is just amazing and it's going to keep happening. Artificial intelligence is going to come in on this and everything else. Computing speed is skyrocketing. They're going to put a computer in at Argonne Labs that will do 2 billion billion operations per second uh, starting next year. This will be able to map the circulatory, human circulatory system through which cancer cells spread. Um, On current supercomputers, which are amazingly fast, they can uh, model a mouse's circulatory system, uh, but it takes a million uh, days of supercomputer time to completely map it. On this new machine, they'll be able to do it in a thousand days. This is like nothing we've ever seen before. So wow. all kinds of modeling is going to improve. They're going to come up with cancer treatments. This is going to help in the development of fusion energy and stuff like that. So it's it's really so, Tom, an interesting you, era. You weren't going to retire in February initially. Your contract had several years to go, but you decided. Yeah. What was the moment when you went, you know what? <laughs> I think I'm done. I've got to start enjoying whatever life I have left. Well, imagine age is a part of it. You, you have to look at the numbers, right? Yeah. And you, me, you're helping. going out a little earlier than had you had planned. Yeah. What was the moment? And how did Hawaii, it looks like Hawaii is going to be your retirement home. Well, it's uh, very, you know what? I've got a little place up in Alaska. Um, uh, I've got, we've got a little place here and I've got a place in Chicago. I'm not going away from Chicago, but I'll spend, be able to spend more time out here. I've grown, grown to love this. I, I bring my books out here and walk the beach and swim every day. It's, I, I and, and I'm learning about this island um, it, it, and the island chain. It's it's an amazing place. So, Gary, I'm hoping to maintain um, a working relationship with WGN and do special projects. I'll be able to report on things, I hope, that I don't have the time to do right now doing day-to-day weather shows. And who knows? I may go on the speaking circuit if they'll have me. Um, I, you know, I've done talks with our congressional reps and, uh, gosh, groups like the League of Women Voters on climate change for years. And uh, I've appeared in front of a congressional committee on climate change. I'd like to talk some more about that. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there on this subject. So, well, it's interesting, Tom, that Hawaii is where you landed because it almost killed you several years ago. Yeah. Tell that story of, of how you almost died. Oh, Gary, I'll tell you, you and I have compared notes on our our interactions with rip currents. I was up on Kauai, the northernmost island. They have a beautiful beach, stretches as far as the eye can see with these gorgeous Alaska or uh, uh, Hawaiian cliffs. And it was the water was raging. I had no business in swimming. And on top of that, it was before my gastric bypass surgery. So I was morbidly obese and I thought I was a teenager. Uh, swimming in the waves, because I always loved swimming in waves. Well, I realized uh, I wasn't touching the ground, and your body goes into a panic mode, and your breathing is all off. I literally, Gary, was two minutes from death, and my roommates were sitting on the beach and saw me and somehow went into this raging surf and pulled me out of the water. And I, it took me about 45 minutes just to get my breath back, and uh, – it, that was frightening. I mean, I, yeah, that I, happens fast. And I had that happen in Mexico. Yeah. And before you know it, you're drowning. And yeah. It's, you, you, you're there and you, it's like it's all going in slow motion. You think, for God's sake, for years I'd heard this happening to other people. And now I know it's happening to me. I'm gone in two minutes. And there's nothing I can do about it. You can't roar over the roar of the waves, scream for help. There was nobody on that beach. 
uh, except my two roommates. We were there all by ourselves. We had it all to ourselves. And, uh, you know, I mentioned that to you, Gary. We talked about that on the radio show. And you would see news clippings on uh, well-known celebrities who got involved in uh, near drowning, and like Anne Hathaway. I remember a couple weeks later, she got tangled up off Kauai in one of these uh, rip currents. And we found out later that 25 people had died of drowning uh, on Kauai and that the state of Hawaii was going to put ocean safety films or debating putting them on flights into the islands. They never did that, but I, I've seen posters, uh, you know, stressing ocean safety. I'll tell you one thing. I'll never go into an ocean well, like that again. Well, Tom, stay by the pool. That's why God made yeah, pools. Exactly. Come on. And, and, now, let's talk about your gastric bypass. How, how yeah. that came about and you dropped oh. how much weight? Oh, my God. I dropped 120 pounds. I, you know, Gary, my father had a stroke, a terrible stroke. He was comatose for a year after that. He survived only two years beyond that. Never walked again, never ate. He was fed intravenously the last two years of his life. And I was on the same course. I was, I was morbidly obese. My legs were swelling. I'd gone diabetic. So I was in trouble. And I worked with a trainer to try and get rid of the weight. My God, I could have been on a treadmill 24 hours a day and never lost what I lost after the surgery. So I went down to Northwestern, Dr. Hungness down there and uh, his team. And Gary, I'll tell you, it takes you, you do six months of training. Uh, you talk to psychologists. They want you to know your life's going to be different. You, uh, certain foods still to this day hit me hard, but I'm back to pretty normal eating. I can't eat anywhere near what I ate, but it's the best thing. I'm no longer diabetic. My cholesterol is normal. All the blood chemistry has come back to normal. And so anybody contemplating it, uh, do it. Uh, they've got different kinds. There's something called the sleeve where they take out 75% of your stomach. I had mm. what was called the uh, Rue and Y version of it. And this is where they staple the top eighth of your stomach, divide your intestines. And mm. by God, uh, sign they me up. I love to have my intestines stapled and tied up on a weekend. Hey, hey, hey I got <laughs> If I remember correctly, you had it done a minute before the pandemic before the lockdown yeah Had you waited another day things would oh, have yeah. been dramatically they different those, uh, elective surgeries they went bye-bye and uh so i was i was lucky and i'll tell you you come out of that and you feel initially like a train hits you but uh i remember there was some guy in the recovery room screaming uh, the f word uh one after you know, you know he was clearly having a bad um uh <laughs> rejoining of reality after his whatever medical procedure he got through and I, you know, you forget when they give you that anesthetic, what you, you've just been through major surgery, but I'll tell you, they took good care of me and the pain was minimal. And it's the best thing I can tell you I've ever done in my life. Uh, and I, I, my health has never been better. I feel great. I've right. had some vertigo issues, but um, other than that, you know, for somebody approaching 72 years old, I'm doing all right. You know? Yeah. And I'm so excited that you're retiring. It, it, it really is. Uh, something that I'm sure everybody will miss in Chicago, seeing you nightly on that weather forecast. But you deserve what you oh. have on, on the background there and everything else you've accomplished uh, to bring you to this. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, Gary, I, I've been really lucky. Uh, you know, there are horror stories in our business, as you well know. Yeah. How, I, I, you know, somehow I dodged all that. I, I'm not quite sure because I went to work every day in my early years thinking I was going to be fired every day. <laughs> So to, to reach this age now and not to have been fired uh, is something of a miracle to me. But it's a, we've had some wonderful GMs over at uh, WGN TV, and they've been, they've been really great, and as have all my colleagues there. It's been a great experience. And uh, uh, I just miss working with you on radio. That's yeah, right. yeah, I do too, Tom. <laughs> and uh, I keep in touch with your assistant, Bill Snyder. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of laughs about uh, different things. And uh, yeah. And, and then he keeps me posted on you if I can't get a hold of you. Yeah. So, so what, what time is it there now? You're uh, to Eastern time. What time? What, how far back are you? Um, we are five hours different uh, behind Chicago. OK. Um, so, so in other words, uh, and it'd be six hours from the East Coast. And so it's so, quite a change. It really is. You know, I get up in the morning. I usually wake up around four o'clock Hawaii time. And I turn on the TV and watch the morning news and all. And uh and it's three hours before the sun comes up. But I'm, 
you know, it takes your body a while to adjust to it. It's, it's pretty interesting. But it's wow. a great flight. They have a direct flight from Chicago out here to Kona on the Big Island every Saturday. Tom, I'm going to correct you. That's a nonstop flight. A direct flight is not nonstop. Do you know that? Oh, all right. I if you say to the, the, the ticket agent, I want a direct flight, she'll go, okay, and then you're going to stop, possibly. If it goes <laughs> in that direction, you've got to say nonstop because that's different. Oh, yeah. See that? All these years I've been flying, and uh, it, it takes you, Gary Meyer, to tell me. So thanks for the correction. I oh, didn't realize hey. that. You and my wife were born at the same hospital. Yeah, McGee Hospital in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And when I told you that, when we discovered that, Gary, you said, see that? Here's yet another example of what I've always contended, and that is that things were meant to happen and that they've been laid out ahead of time somehow in the whole scheme yeah. of things. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, by the way, you know, we've got it like this. Can I show you what? You see <laughs> oh, oh my God. Is. This, That's this is, beautiful. Isn't uh, that something? Do you see that Mauna Loa, the volcano off in the distance there? Yeah. That's, that's, um, that's the volcano where they measure um, carbon dioxide. They've got instrumentation up there. It's the longest running record of carbon dioxide levels on the planet. It was put there by a guy named Charles Keeling who was a Northwestern University, University of Illinois alum, who developed equipment that would measure carbon dioxide. It's up at 11,200 feet on that 13,000 foot volcano. So when you hear that carbon dioxide is at a new level and it's higher now than it has been any time in the last 3 million years, uh, that's where they measure it, up there. Uh, one of the places, now they measure it a bunch of places, but he did that back in the 1950s. And that's kind of interesting. Right when out we did our show from the Big Island, there was snow yeah. on top. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, in fact, when you, one year when I was renting uh, the car at the airport, um, they said they had a, a mimeograph sheet they set out with it. And they said, you're not allowed to drive up into the snow because these mountain roads <laughs> are something. There's a little town 15 miles from where I am. I'm down at sea level. It's at 2,500 feet, and you go up there, and it's like 20 degrees cooler. It's really amazing. Uh, nobody needs air conditioning up there in a little town called Waimea. Pretty little town. And you know what else they've got out here? They've got these ranches. Uh, Hawaiian cowboys uh, roam this area. The most beautiful ranches that stretch as far as the eye can see. And I remember as a kid, I used to look at these little dots on maps, the Hawaiian islands, and I thought, boy, they must be crowded. Uh, not realizing that how much terrain there really is out there. Uh, Tom, so it's, forget it's weather. You should be the Hawaiian spokesperson. <laughs> I mean, you don't need to go and do anything besides that. I mean, you're selling it, brother. Uh, you know what, Gary? I was out here for the Kilauea volcano in 2018. I, I got up at 1.30 in the morning, drove over to a boat out of Hilo, and you went an hour boat ride, and you could see the sky glowing orange the whole way from all the lava. And the lava went into the ocean. And the captain of the boat said, now, look, we're going out in 14-foot seas, so most of you are going to get sick, but don't worry about it. The crew will, too. And we did. We got sick, but it was the kind of thing where they were passing buckets around for everybody. There was a German family on one side of me and an Australian family on the other side. And you didn't care. You were watching this 2,000-degree lava going into the ocean and this big thunderhead forming over all this heat being released by the lava stream. It was wow, I don't think it would matter if you puked in the lava. It would just blend. <laughs> oh, it would. Yeah. You'd, yeah. You'd, you'd fry it. Well, it was interesting, too. When the waves would break over the bow, it was like bathtub warm water coming at you. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Yeah, of 3,000 degrees. Yeah. So was that as exciting as watching the total eclipse? Because oh, I think was... a lot of people in Chicago were right with you in your emotional response to that. You, you know, Leslie, I was so embarrassed. Um, oh, you know, you no. went, you watched night go to day in five minutes. It was almost like a religious experience. And I, I, I thought I'm on live television and I'm losing it. And <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I broke down and other people around me did too. It's hard to describe how your body processes something is to go from midday sunlight to a, a black sky with stars in it um, in five minutes is the most amazing thing 
uh, you'll ever well, see Tom, it. that really defines how much of a speck we are. When you go out at night and just look up in the sky yeah. and see the universe, we don't matter. And, and we lose so sight true, of that. Gary. I mean, and we go into these weird entanglements with each other and countries right. and this and that. And we're, what are we doing? We're Isn't nothing. Isn't the truth? You know what we ought to do? We ought to get all warring ar armies, put them on a bunch of spaceships and just launch them to see our planet from on top. And there say, you go. Oh, look, guys, look at this and then look out into the darkness of, uh, you know, space and tell me that what you're fighting about really matters worth a hell there of beans, you know? There it it's, is. Amen. You're so true. You're so right. All right. There. And let's Tom, see, yeah, I will Tom be was in chased. touch. Wait, 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 wait. Before, before Tom goes, I want to hear him talk about being chased by that tornado. Oh. That, that to me was one of the best sound bites of Tom's in all the years I lived in Chicago. Boy, you know, it's interesting. Do you know, I didn't want to do that. Um, we had a uh, videographer, Steve Shure, and uh, uh, my producer, Pam Grimes, who said, you got to go on a storm chase. And I had done that before. I said, look, the world has three storm chases a night on the Weather Channel and the Discovery Channel. The last thing it needs is another storm chase. And they said, yeah, but you haven't done it. I said, nobody gives it darn. I, you know what? So I go out there and we pulled over to watch this dying tornado and hit the road again, not realizing the big event was to spin up and chase us down the highway at 60 miles an hour. And we were losing ground to it. This was a multiple vortex tornado. And I, we had a little, we had a Chicago Tribune photographer in the uh, uh, front seat, it's big new biz dad. Uh, and he, he's there with his, you know, three foot long lenses and all leaning out the window. Yeah. And he, he quietly says, I think we've got one chasing us. So we had so much equipment in, in the car, I couldn't see out the window. So I rolled down the window, looked out and my God, here comes this Disney world like multiple vortex tornado bearing down on us. I'm looking at our $2 million satellite truck and my colleagues in it, uh, four cars behind us, thinking I'm gonna see them go airborne at any moment. And we're lucky we survived that thing. I, I'll tell you, that was And didn't the tornado amazing. say, pull over motherfucker, because you've, re <laughs> you've reported your last EF5, that's you, it. You, you know what, Gary, we pulled over in this little town. It was in Northeast Oklahoma and the sirens were all blowing uh, just to kind of catch our breath after this thing went out into a field and was wrapped in rain and disappeared from sight. But then we hit the road again and we went onto the Kansas Turnpike. We were going back to Wichita and all these semis were flipped on the side of the road on top of cars. I'm sure there were dead people uh, in these uh, cars and these trucks. And we kept going because we knew we were not equipped to help anybody. That's right. Uh, and that's the best thing to do is not help. Uh, Tom, I, I yeah. got to say, think about the, I don't know if it's irony or the bizarreness of if that tornado caught up with you and you died in a tornado. <laughs> think about how weird, I know. talk about weirdness. You know what? I'll tell you, I worked with a guy who was head of the Chicago Weather Service. He came over and was a part of our team when we were putting the Tribune page together. Paul Daly. Paul is the guy who, after the heat wave, killed all those people in 1995 in Chicago, worked with the health commissioner, John Wilhelm, to come up with what to do when heat's approaching. And now we open cooling centers and make sure the elderly are looking on. We didn't do that back in those days, and 700 people died. But Paul jogged, and he lived out in the Fox Valley, and he said, you know, he said, every time I go out and a thunderstorm comes up, I think, please, God, don't let me get struck by lightning because... Can you imagine the story that the head of the weather service was killed the jogging in a thunderstorm? Yes. And you and almost I, it was, got there. It was kind of the same thing, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you oh know, when, when, when Sean, my roommate, fished me out of the water, I told him, let me go. You're going to get dragged in into this rip current. And you know what he said to me afterwards? He said, now, look, don't get all teary eyed about this or think I saved you because I loved you. He said, I didn't want to be the one to go back to Chicago and say, hey, I sat on a beach and watched this Tom Skilling drowned out there. Oh, and uh, okay. and I, said, I said, well, thanks, Sean. That's, Don't that's think really I, nice. I love you or anything. Not, I just didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to deal with the paperwork. I the backlash. I told him, I said, yeah. you know, Sean, nobody's going to blame you. They're going to say, what did that stupid idiot do going into, uh, you know, 14 foot seas? Like he was, I wish teenager. I had a picture of you sticking your face out the window and yelling at the tornado. That's a moment. Well, Tom, 
Uh, listen, I appreciate the time, and uh, oh. I'll be in touch. Have a Merry Christmas. You too. And, and Leslie, thank you for your sweet words. Uh, no, working well, with you guys is has been just great. I hope we do this again. Uh, oh, thank- yeah. Yes, we will. please. And, and I hope you have the greatest retirement because you deserve it. Thanks, Gary. Right, right back at you uh, on Merry Christmas to all of you guys and happy holidays and thank everybody you. watching. Uh, all thanks, right. Gary. thanks, Tom. Leslie, see you guys. Bye, the Walt Tom. Disney of weather, right there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you, you nailed it with that. Uh, oh. Yeah. And that's it for all the news and nonsense here at the Gear Force. If you like that, I got other stuff I think you're going to like. This is the Gear Force. Thanks for streaming. Like, subscribe, and be kind. But no need to rewind. It sure would be terrific if you subscribe to the Gear Force Live YouTube channel. More eyeballs. If you are watching this show recorded, that button is right here. And if you'd like to look at past episodes, try that button. Boom. Shaka laka. That's it. Oh, I guess I'm alone again. All right. How do you shut this thing off?